I hope you have a snack and a drink and we will talk through some behavior. How do you respond to behavior? So in your classroom, if you don't mind, um, uh, or just take a minute and think about it. What's your standard response for student behavior? Maybe it's good behavior. Maybe it's challenging behavior. Um, your choice. Just take a minute and think about what's your automatic responses uh, when you're dealing with behavior. I will say behavior is a hot topic always, right? I will tell you many years ago when I was a new teacher, how did I respond to student behavior? Um, I fell back on what I call automatic responses. So I was raised in Eastern Kentucky. Um, I live pretty close to Menifee County. I live on Cave Run Lake. Um, and so when I was growing up, if you misbehaved, then what happened? You are automatically punished, right? Typically developing student. Uh, when I was in school, I never misbehaved <laughs> because punishment was very effective stopping point for me because I very much wanted to socially please the adults around me. And that's the way that's part of just me instinctively maybe, but it, it was the culture that I was raised in. Um, how we respond to behavior comes back to our own experiences and the things that we were taught, right? And then we became special education teachers and we bump into students who have sometimes significant challenges, but sometimes just repeated challenges. Same things happen over and over. Um, and so now we have to be behavior detectives. Um, if you're a special education teacher, probably your number one job for many students is trying to find out why is this behavior occurring before we respond to it. Uh, because if we don't know why a behavior is occurring, then we can't essentially treat that behavior. We're, our responses are just as likely to make the behavior happen again and again. And that's what happens. And the longer that a student practices um, maladaptive behavior or behavior that is dysfunctional, right? So behavior that is not safe, behavior that is not functional for society, um, behavior that is not compatible with being socially acceptable to friends, the longer they practice that behavior, the more entrenched it becomes, right? The harder it is to change that behavior. My first year of teaching, I taught high school and I stepped into a classroom with 11 students. Um, four of whom had autism, including a set of twins um, that were autistic and which were very different as night and day, but both had that diagnosis plus several others. And, and this has been nah, a long time ago now, 20 years, maybe, I don't even know. Um, anyways, I stepped into this classroom and I thought my hardest job would be teaching academics, but it became learning how to respond to behavior and having to come up with some automatic responses for myself, because as the teacher, we're put on the spot. And if I don't have an automatic response to behavior, if I don't have some sort of plan in my mind to their misbehavior, especially for students that have repeated misbehavior, then I fall back into the same patterns of how I'm responding. And if it didn't fix it the first 10 times, this is probably not going to fix it. This probably isn't gonna work. So I have to do something different. The first thing that we have to do if we have a student who is having behavioral challenge is we have to take and look at some ABCs. So antecedent, um, and if you've been a special education teacher for a long time, you've probably heard of these. Um, these are our, literally, we start the alphabet with ABCs, and if we're dealing with behavior, we have to start with our ABCs of behavior. So antecedent is what happens right before the behavior occurs. And the B is the behavior, and it should be um, specific. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And the C is what are the consequences? What happens when the student reacts in that way? So these are my, these are some common examples that I see. So antecedent is the student is asked to transition back to work. They've been on a break and the teacher has um, asked them to come back to the table to work again. So what does the student do? The student says, no, <laughs> and falls to the floor, right? So what are the consequences? Sometimes the student is redirected to the desk um, or sometimes the student is given a longer break, right? So which 
consequence is probably going to not feed this behavior, right? Because the consequence that we invoke based on that child's behavior, that is what's going to either stop this behavior from occurring or it's going to feed the behavior and make this behavior continue to get worse or they'll just continue in this pattern because it's getting them what they want. So in this case, the student was given a longer break time. So, which is not, which is not, which is not a response that you want to do. Um, not, I have done it in case of emergency. There's some terrible emergency, but on a day-to-day -day basis, basis, if I give the student a longer break time, what am I teaching them? I'm teaching them that I get longer break time by saying no and falling to the floor, right? So a part of what we'll talk about today is I need to teach them replacement behavior, right? So if a student wants a break, then they need to ask for additional break time. In this case, the student has already been on a break, right? He's been on a break and I'm trying to get him to come back to the table to work with me. So in this case, for this student, we had to transition them back to work, back to the work table with a preferred activity, right? So when they came back to the table to work with me, I didn't have them come and sit down and do, they hated um, writing. They hated anything that they had to actually hold a pencil and write. So I would not transition them back from a break with a writing activity. I would transition them back from a break with an activity that they had to glue, um, glue pieces onto a paper. So maybe they were gluing down answers or gluing something down because this student really liked to glue, right? And so I'm, I'm putting in, I'm putting in some stopgap measures to make it to where they will come back. And then I'm teaching them <laughs> appropriate ways. So when they say no and they fall to the floor, I'm redirecting them back to the table. I'm prompting them and I'm holding steady with that activity because I know that it's the student is able, right? So if this is happening, I'm thinking in my head, well, is the student not coming back to work? because they don't want to, they have a really hard time transitioning every, you know, every time they have to transition from activity to activity, then there's a problem. So that's one consideration. In my head, I'm thinking, is this work um, appropriate for the student? Maybe the work is something that's going to be really hard for the student and they've experienced a lot of failure. And if that's the case, then I need to think, I need to consider that. And for this student, he had a lot of failure with writing. And every day after break, and we did, we did the break on purpose. So he had a physical break, um, he got some movement in, and then we were asking him to come to the table and write, which was something really hard for him and he hated. So he would not come back to the table if it was writing. So we made his schedule to where after his break, he came back to the table for a short activity that he really enjoyed, which was gluing. And then <laughs> we did the writing activity. So he did not get out of it but it could not be the reason that he came back to the table. Okay, the other one that I see a lot, especially preschool, kindergarten, young kids. So they're sitting in circle time. Um, the child has a hard time sitting in the group, right? So sitting in the group with their other kids around them, it's difficult. Um, they don't share space well, so they hit their neighbor. So what happens when you hit your neighbor? Well, you're removed from circle because you can't hit your friends and you can't even hit your enemies really, right? So we have to think about what's happening in this situation. So we know the antecedent was he's sitting in the circle time. The behavior is very specific. He hit his neighbor and the consequence was he was removed from circle. In this case, I'm thinking about what's happening. I'm being a behavior detective, right? I'm thinking through what are the possible reasons why the child hit his neighbor? Well, I know this kid has a really hard time sharing space. So I'm going to purposely sit him on the outside edge of the circle. He can't take having kids sit on both sides of him. He needed a little bit more space to wiggle. And then I'm also going to think about ways that I can adapt the environment. I'm gonna give him, for this student, we specifically gave him something called a how to hug chair. Um, it's a little tiny chair um, that's not really a chair. It doesn't have legs, but when you sit in the floor, it gives you a defined space that's yours. And that for this kid solved the problem instead of continually removing them from the circle because it had become to the point where every day they went to circle time, every day the kid hit whoever was next to him, every day he was removed from the circle. And we got stuck in that pattern of behavior for the student 
and for the adults. So we had to change, we had to change what we were doing. And we'll talk about that as we go. But ABC data is critical. And you don't have to take a lot of it. In that Google Drive, there are a couple of sheets. ABC data can be a checklist like this example on the screen. Um, this is something that I found many years ago and I like it because it's broken down. Um, I had, I don't think you need, it used to be old school, you had to have days and days of ABC data, but really you just need enough ABC data to know what's going on. For some kids, you can figure that out in 10 minutes. For other kids, it might take a few days. Um, so I wouldn't take copious amounts of ABC data unless I was using that um, specifically for an IEP goal collection, like I'm collecting data for an IEP goal. But if I'm collecting data just to change a behavior, then I'm just going to take the minimal amount <laughs> that I can figure out what is causing, what's feeding this behavior, right? If I don't feed a behavior, then it's going to stop. Um, so I have to figure out what's feeding this behavior. Then I have to figure out a replacement for that behavior. How can they get the same thing, but with a socially appropriate approach, right? And then how can I support them by modifying the environment? And I, ha I have slides for this throughout, so we'll, we'll talk more about it. But there are two different examples of these ABC data collection charts inside of that Google Drive. There are a thousand and one on, out in Google world. <laughs> if you Google ABC data collection free, a million Jillian will come up. As long as they collect the data that you need, then they're not wrong right? As long as they're giving you the information that you need, then there's no right or wrong example that you need to take, unless your district has a specific policy or procedure that says, here's our ABC data collection chart. I have ran into that a few times, but it's more uncommon than common. Okay, so why do we need to know that ABC data? So because if we have that ABC data, then function of this behavior. <laughs> uh, what's the function? So WTFs, um, what's the function, right? What's the function of this behavior? <laughs> um, the most four most common functions are everybody eats, right? E is escape, attention, tangible, and sensory. And I add medical. So I say everybody eats meat, which I know they don't, but that's my M piece, right? Um, but we need that piece in there. So we're gonna talk about what these are. So what is escape? Escape means I am getting the heck out of here and I don't care how I get out of here. It might not be socially appropriate because let's be real people. If you could have gone to work today and it's been a rough day, it's time change week, it's a full moon. <laughs> it's a full moon, I can feel it. I'm sure you're feeling it. It's time change week on top of that. And if the weather is awesome, which makes us all wanna be outside and pushes us over the edge. If I could have went to work today, laid down on the floor and had a screaming crying fit to get out of work, would you not do it sometimes? Yeah, it's totally, if my boss would say, Kim, you look like you're having a really bad day. I'm so sorry, why don't you just go home? I would, totally, I would totally use escape behavior by screaming and crying in the floor, right? Um, so escape is I wanna get out of here. And however I can do that, that's how I'm gonna do it. Attention could be good attention. It could be bad attention. We've all heard about the soggy potato chips. Kids with, most kids don't differentiate between good attention and bad attention. So however I can get attention, that's how I'm going to get it. Tangible. Um, is an item that I can hold in my hand or something you can give me. So a sticker, a popsicle, it could be um, iPad time, it could be access to the computer, access to the playground, any of those I would consider tangible. So anything you can give me or something that I can access. Automatic reinforcement and sensory um, is the other piece of this. And that is a lot of times for students with autism, uh, we see things, automatic reinforcement uh, could be hand flapping. It could be trying to meet a sensory need. So I had a student who punched people and we, well, let, let me tell you a different one. That's a shorter example. So I had a student who was biting. I worked with a, a preschooler this year who was biting and um, it was an, a new and unusual behavior for them. And so when we were trying to figure out what's the function of this behavior, well, it came back to a sensory need. This child was biting. Everybody bite your teeth down just slightly, not too hard. You'll break, your, <laughs> break out your teeth, don't do that. When you bite your teeth down, it puts deep pressure into your jaw. If you've ever had a toothache, 
And when you bite down, it temporarily relieves that pain, right? So this student had gotten a really bad toothache and nobody knew about it because he did not have a good way to communicate that need. Instead, he figured out his own self that when he bit down, that the pain stopped and he did not have a socially appropriate system of how to meet this need. And so he started biting down on people um, with an unfortunate, a high rate of, of biting people. And so we figured out this was a sensory need. So thankfully he got into the dentist, which as you all know, accessing dental care for students who have high needs takes several months. Uh, but when he was able to get into the dentist, he had to go immediately because we found out that his tooth was abscessed. And so once he got the medical treatment that he needed, um, so this one is both medical and sensory, right? Once he got the medical treatment that he needed, then the biting stopped, right? And medical needs, and sensory needs can sometimes pair together. I've ran into a lot of that, especially for our students who have poor communication system. It's a huge, huge, sad problem for them. Um, really tough thing to deal with. I'm gonna try to show a video. This is a video. So this is ABC. So this is an example for you. So what I want you to do is watch this example. What's the What's the antecedent? So what's, what is happening right before the behavior occurs? What is the behavior? What is the consequence? Hopefully you should see this video. Sometimes this goes well, and sometimes people will say, I can't see the video. Okay, A, B, C, so what did you see? Um, think about that for a second. Okay, what was the ABC of that behavior? What did you see on the screen just now? So the little girl was at the computer, right? Our A was, our A was what? Our A was, she was asked to finish, right? This is pretty common. We're constantly as educators telling kids, all right, you have to finish. <laughs> right? Uh, you have to be done. So what's the little girl's response? What's her behavior, RB, right? If I was tracking this, I would say the child said no. And she kind of ignored the adult, right? She didn't even turn around. She didn't look at you. <laughs> she just said no and kept on going. What was the consequence of her behavior? What happened with the adult? What was the adult's response when she said no, the adult did what? Um, the consequence from the little girl was the mom or the teacher, whoever it was, the adult in her life said five more minutes. So how did she get five more minutes on the computer? She said no, and she ignored the adult. So for me, I know that I am, for me, that's feeding that student's behavior, right? We have to teach her, we have to give her a way to get more time on the computer by not reinforcing her saying no, right? We don't want her to, when an adult tells you to do something um, where she's given a direction, hey, it's time to get off the computer. She says no and ignores the adult. We need to, we have to figure out another way for that. For me, that would be problematic, especially that's going to be problematic if she's in a classroom with 30 other kids and they're about to transition to the next activity, right? It won't be functional for her. So what do we do with this information? Okay. So once we have this ABC data, and we know the function of the behavior. So what purpose is this behavior serving? What does this get the child or what does this do for the child? Then we look for the pattern, right? We're gonna look for the pattern. Um, and once we can figure out the patterns, then we can change the behavior, right? So this is the critical piece. I know I've spent several minutes on this. If you can figure out this ABC data collection, um, and if you start, when you have a student who has a behavior, if you start with this piece, then your opportunities to correct or modify or change this behavior is much more likely to be successful. And there's a ton of research behind this, right? There's a ton of research that says, if we have a problematic behavior, then we have to start by figuring out why is that behavior occurring? Because if we don't know why, then we will accidentally feed the behavior or make the behavior worse by the consequences that we install. 
I'll give you an example. I work with a student who was middle schooler and he was going out to regular um, PE class. Uh, and he did, there were some times of the month that he did really well. He went to PE class, he participated and uh, was you know, fully able to be functional in PE class. Other times when he went to PE class, he would pick up a ball and throw it at someone's head as hard as he could. And when he picked up the ball and threw it at the head, then what happened? Well, he got sent to the bleachers, right? He got sent to the bleachers um, for timeout, which is not an un, which is not an incorrect response on the part of the adult, right? If you throw a ball at somebody's head, that's not safe. And he was throwing it hard enough that it would take you out. It was knocking kids to the ground, right? This is um, not a safe behavior. So he got sent to the bleachers. So a few several times a month, a few days a month, that's what this kid did. And, and they had looked at why and they couldn't figure it out. So I have to start this ABC data. We need to know what's happening because that antecedent, that A part information is critical. And the it, C part is critical. What's the consequence? So here's what we found out. The pattern that we found out when we had a couple, we had several data points was the pattern was, was that on days that that gym class was going to play basketball, then the gym teacher would start them out by asking them to run laps. I don't know why he only had them run laps on days that they had basketball, but on days they were going to do basketball, then they all had to run so many laps. Well, this student hated running. I mean, who can blame him? I don't want to run either. This kid hated running. And so he figured out to get out of running, how do I escape from running? I pick up a ball and I chuck it at somebody's head really hard. Then the gym teacher yells at me and I get sent to the bleachers for the entire gym class to where I can just sit up there and hang out by myself. And this kid was perfectly happy to sit in the bleachers and he figured out how to make that happen. So we had to go in and we had to change the environment. We changed the environment by, I asked the gym teacher, I said, hey, don't put the balls out <laughs> when it's on, you know, because the gym teacher would put, you know, the big ball cart, he would push it to the front of um, the gym. I said, leave that in the back. I know it will take a couple of minutes, but don't put that out <laughs> because that was his trigger. He was all that cart of balls that he was going to be asked to run, which he was not very successful with and he hated it. And then we modified the assignment essentially for that student. And we said, okay, running five laps around this big, huge gym is not a reasonable ask. And I think the gym teacher would have modified it if the kid had ever attempted to run. Um, but I think that I think that there was just confusion on both parts. And so we modified the ask. We said, okay, the first goal is the student is gonna walk two laps. So when the student got there and he didn't see the balls, he was instructed to walk two laps with a buddy. So he got to pick a buddy. <laughs> from amongst the other kids who were having to run laps and they walked two laps while everyone else run. And then over a series of months, they increased the number of laps that he walked. And then by the end of the year, the student was doing kind of a fast walk run uh, and he was no longer trying to throw balls, right? Because we had changed the environment. We had changed the setup to where he still eventually had to do what everybody else was doing, right? But we had to put some things into place for him first to let him be successful um, because that's the goal for everybody, right? Okay, so tips for de-escalation. If you do have a student that is very upset, first off, you should know if you have a student who is in um, distress, like they are angry or mad or upset, however you wanna see that they're crying or they're just furious, you should know that your brain automatically shuts down. I don't know why um, we're designed that way, but as human beings, we are designed that when we get emotionally upset or really frightened or really angry, the higher functioning parts of our brain shut off <laughs> and we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. So I'm gonna fight you to the death or hopefully not the death, right? I'm gonna fight you to the end. I'm going to freeze up. So I'm gonna become, I can't do anything at all. I'm just frozen in place or I'm going to run for my life. Um, this happened to me. <laughs> this totally has happened to me. I was chased by a spider, <laughs> by a black widow spider. Um, and I, my son had been bitten earlier in the year by a brown recluse. It was a summer of dangerous spiders for us. He was about seven years old. He weighed less than hundred pounds. If you, if you weigh under hundred pounds and you get bit by a black widow spider, then you can die. 
my son is being chased by the spider. They are somewhat aggressive and he had made it angry <laughs> because that is how our life works. My higher functioning parts of my brain shut off. I pick up my child. I run across the parking lot. I get on top of my car. <laughs> the spider chased us about 20 feet. Um, and so we're on the roof of my car. I can't think. It doesn't occur to me until like several minutes when I'm in the process of calming down. Oh my gosh, it's a spider, right? It could have just climbed up my car, but I didn't have any rational thinking. <laughs> I didn't have any rational thinking. All I could do was run for my life. I, I outweighed that spider by at least a thousand times. I could have stomped on it. I could have done a thousand things, but instead I ran for my life because the higher functioning parts of my brain said, run for your life, Kim. <laughs> this is not your day. Um, so know that if you're dealing with a student who is in distress, they are angry, they are upset, they are crying, then this is not the time to reason with them. This is not the time to ask them why. This is not the time to have a big conversation. This is time for de-escalation essentially, right? Our job is to help that child calm down. So stay calm. You have to be calm yourself. And if you can't be calm, then you need a way to tag team out. You need another adult to support you. Get on the level of the child. Be aware of your own body and facial expressions, right? Kids can read those and they can tell when you're mad. And this is not the time for them to know that you're mad. This will not support you. This is not the time to reason with them. Validate feelings, not actions. So if I have a student who's really angry, I and, and I think it's for a, a reason that is not valid, I would still say, I can see that you're angry. I can see that you're angry. I wouldn't say, I can see that you're angry and you threw chairs all around the room, right? I'm going to validate the feelings. I'm, I don't want to validate the actions. This might be the time for silence. This is also the time in my classroom that um, maybe I have, can. this is when I need to move other students out. Um, maybe I am turning down the lights to make it be, to give it a quieter atmosphere. Maybe this is time for a movement break. If they're not in extreme distress and they're able, maybe getting a drink of water or allowing them to go to the restroom. Um, avoid saying no. <laughs> this is a hard time. You don't wanna get into the process of saying no. Um, think about your alternatives to saying no, because really at this point, you don't need to have a conversation with the student at all. Your best goal is to um, be as quiet as possible and allow them to get through the meltdown, whatever is happening here. Avoid placing demands. Um, this is not the time to place a lot of demands. Probably they can't hear you. The only demand that I might consider is if we're in the hallway or if we're in some place that is not safe and I need to move them someplace that is safe for them to be this upset. I might consider distraction. It would depend upon what is happening. Um, if I'm in a hallway where it's not safe for the student to be upset, then maybe I'm going to distract. If I'm in my classroom, I would want to, and maybe I'm going to distract. I'm not going to distract with their favorite item, probably, right? This is not the time for me to say, you're so upset. Let's go on down to the gym and shoot, you know, uh, to let's go down. Let's do your favorite thing right now, right? Um, because I don't want this to become how they get that reward. So I want to think about some kind of medium level distraction. So some sort of reinforcer that they do enjoy, but it's not their, one of their main things that they're working for. I don't want this to become how they think they get that. Other important things, teach and reinforce expected behaviors. So what are the behaviors that are expected in this environment? What are the rules here? What are other people doing? So case in point, so I teach my students um, not to yell, right? So we don't yell in school, we don't yell. But outside on the playground, then yelling is probably appropriate, right? So what are, the ex what are the expected behaviors for the environment that they're in? If you have a student who goes through frequent cycles of um, becoming very upset, so a meltdown, whatever that looks like for them, then you need to identify you need to identify what their escalation cycle looks like. So most kids, when they get into this repeated um, meltdown, repeated tantrums, repeated whatever, insert whatever you want, there's a pattern to it, right? Look for those patterns and figure out how do I break this cycle early? <laughs> how do I stop this at the beginning of the cycle so that my student doesn't have to keep going through this? What can I do? 
identify environmental factors that can be changed, right? So how, what can I change in the environment? Maybe for my kid with the basketball, the issue in the gym, we didn't put the basketballs out right away, right? We put them out after they had walked. Easy fix. You can't throw basketballs if there's not any available right now, right? Um, so other things that you can think about. For some of my students that had difficulty with transitions, I had to increase their visual supports that were provided to them during transitions. And maybe I gave them, maybe I gave them a transition warning. Hey, you know, your break time is over in two minutes. Maybe they have a visual timer so they know when break time is going to be over. Those are examples of how you might manipulate the environment. And then identify replacement behaviors that are being taught. So what are the replacement behaviors? Because if I'm trying to stop a behavior, that behavior is serving a purpose for that student. So what, what can I teach them to, so that they can still get the same things with appropriate behavior versus whatever um, dysfunctional behavior that they're using? All right, tools for your toolbox. So we're going to spend the next few minutes and I'm gonna go over just some things that you might know about or might not know about um, really quickly, right? We're gonna finish on time, we're doing great. Um, so I wanna tell you about evidence-based practices, right? When I first came into the classroom, there was no such thing as evidence-based practices many years ago, right? Even up until, <laughs> even until probably, you know, in the last 10 years, they weren't commonly known about. Um, I was a regular classroom, I was a special education classroom teacher, and no one told me, hey, you have all of these students with significant challenges or without significant challenges, but here are some evidence-based practices that you could use with them that will improve their lives. Um, so these are very cool. They come from, um, they come from the National Autism, the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders. I can't say that three times fast. So the top link brings you to affirm modules. We don't have enough time today. I mean, we literally could talk about behavior for weeks, right? And I've talked about it for years and years and I still learn new things all the time. But affirm modules are free. You create a login because everybody wants your email. They don't spam you, but it gives you a way that you can go through a ton of really good modules that are based for school um, and will walk you through resources. These are great to share with families too. It's open to everyone. So this slide is, I, I created this as a single slide and uploaded this so you could print this out as a full page if you wanted. Um, I love this slide. What it does is on the left side of your screen, and I know it's on a screen, so if you're like me, you have to lean forward to see the, <laughs> to see the words. On the left side of your screen going down is a list of evidence-based practices. It starts with antecedent-based interventions. Across the top, um, at the very top, it says pre-academic adaptive self-help behavior is the third category over. All of those that are highlighted are for behavior. The yellow color is birth to five. The blue color is ages six to 15, uh, or six to 14. And the green color is 15 to 21. Now you'll notice as that green color has less of the gaps filled in. That's because a lot of the research is focused on that younger ages. I tell teachers that even if it's not, um, if, even if it's not validated totally by research, but it shows promise at age 14, I don't know why it would stop working at age 15 or 16. Does that make sense? Um, so I'm still gonna use those, but you can see behavior ages six to 14, which is probably most of you, right? That school age um, has a ton of things. There are so many resources. There are so many evidence-based practices that are out there that you could use with your students. Now I tell teachers, I don't put these, I wouldn't use every single one of these, right? I don't wanna make myself crazy. But what I do wanna do is I'm going to choose some of these, and some of these are things that are going to show up in a student with autism's IEP. Now, as a teacher, I have used these for students with a variety of disabilities, um, but they work with a lot of kids. I have used those evidence-based practices in my Sunday school classroom. <laughs> I've used them for adults. Um, they're pretty useful for a lot of people. All right, let me tell you about this. So this is behavior lifesaver. If I have a student who has behavior challenges, these are the things that I'm going to start with. So behavior lifesaver is schedules, 
does the student have an appropriate visual schedule? Maybe it's written word. If they can read and uh, if they're a fluent reader, then it's just written word. If this is a student who has, is not yet a reader or is very young, then maybe it's actual photographs or maybe it's board maker type pictures. I don't know, but figuring out what's the right schedule for that student. It could be objects based upon student need, right? I'm also going to acknowledge or access communication attempts, attempts. If you have a student who has, who is non-speaking or they have very limited words that they are speaking, then we know that a lot of times behavior, um, significant behavioral challenges will come from that, right? If I can't tell you I want a cookie or if I can't say, get out of my face, <laughs> it's much more likely that I'm gonna present with challenging behavior because I don't have an effective way to communicate to get my wants and needs met. Um, the V in SAVER is visual supports for behavior. And there are a thousand and one kinds of visual supports out there for behavior. Um, e is expectations. And these are valid high expectations. So I'm making sure that I do have expectations. My students aren't just hanging out in the classroom with me and we don't have anything to do all day. So we, are, we have a routine and a schedule and they have expectations that are fair to them that they are able to meet. And then I'm looking at my reinforcement is the R, reinforcement and routines, right? So I'm making sure that my students have a way to access reinforcement. What's their paycheck? You know, what are, how, are, how am I paying them for doing the things that I need them to do in the day? And that can look like a lot of things. What are the common routines in my classroom? Do we have a set schedule and structure to our day? Am I teaching my students those things? because that will benefit me greatly. A resource for you um, from the Autism Helper, I love her. This resource is um, information about how to collect ABC data in a way that is simple and doable for you and your classroom. And I am gonna pause here at this point. We are done. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you all.